Hey, all you cool cats and kittens, it's your favorite history teacher back at you again with another historical video. And today we are starting chapter two, uh, the war in the West and the Civil War. So uh, we are getting through some important, important dates, important times in U.S. history. And so what better way to start off right now? I'm going to share my screen. Okay. So this is titled War in the West, obviously Civil War. And of course, the settling of the West, manifest destiny, all that. So this is chapter two. So I would like you to put this at the top of your margin. It's a two title note day. So put this at the top of your margin, War in the West. And then today we're going to talk about the sectional crisis. So again, the time period before the war, kind of the events that are going to obviously lead to secession in, in the beginnings of the Civil War. Uh, so that was your warm up. Objectives, we're going to explain the belief in manifest destiny. Discuss the deepening sectional crisis in the 1850s. And we're also going to describe the events that led to the secession of the, Un the Southern states. All right, uh, Journey West, my young friend. So as we discussed in the previous lecture, the Louisiana Purchase allowed for many people to explore this unknown, uncharted territory. Uh, Oregon and California. The opportunity to farm on fertile soil, the fur trade or trade with foreign nations across the Pacific Ocean lured more farmers, adventurers, and merchants out west. And the belief in manifest destiny, this American God given right to expand westward and spread the country out to the Pacific Ocean from sea to shining sea um, and manifest destiny again is this kind of belief that it's our right it's our land and of course as we know we weren't the first people here so yeah a little arrogance in my in my opinion so uh, uncharted territory, uh, latecomers who missed out on the Midwest sprint for land. Americans will set their sights on Oregon and California. Uh, this is territory claimed by other nations like Russia, Great Britain, and of course, Mexico. By 1845, however, around 700 Americans were living in and around the Sacramento Valley. Government officials in uh, the Mexican session relied on these settlers because they were suspicious to whom their loyalties belonged to. So you have Eastern and West, East to Western routes towards the Pacific Ocean. You have the Oregon Trail, the California Trail, and the Santa Fe Trail. And Plains Indians started to realize that the threat of their way of life uh, but was happening by more and more settlers coming over land. So here, it all, I don't know why, but it all starts in Independence, Missouri. That's where most of these trails start. So this is the fabled Oregon Trail. Uh, you could play that on what, it's an Apple, it's an Apple game, uh, the Oregon Trail. This looks very digitalized like the game, Oregon Trail. Uh, another one, uh, the California Trail. Again, the Oregon Trail splitting up up here. And they're coming towards San Francisco. And then the Santa Fe Trail, obviously going to Santa Fe, modern day New Mexico. Again, where does it start? Independence. Independence. All right, so welcome to the party. Many uh, Americans settled in the Mexican region of Tejas in the northern state of Coahuila. Sorry if I butchered that. Um, although the Mexican government encouraged settlement to their land, tensions soon will mount. 
1830, Mexico closed the borders to immigration, but American leaders Stephen F. Austin and Sam Houston wanted to renegotiate this policy. After many unsuccessful repeals, they decided to separate from Mexico to form their own government. And of course, that's going to piss off Mexico. So uh, there are going to be skirmishes uh, between the Texas militia and some, you know, people who wanted to defend Texas. It was uh, originally called the Lone Star Republic. And there are going to be devastating losses, uh, American losses at Alamo and Goliad. Remember the Alamo? Um, however, Americans are going to feel revitalized and the calls for re, uh, Remember the Alamo are going to help defeat the Mexican forces at the Battle of San Jacinto uh, in 1836. Five months later, citizens, because there were already a lot of Americans, American settlers there, they're going to, dem not demand, they're going to vote for annexation of Texas into the Union. Annexation, how I always like to teach annexation, is to add or to gobble up. Uh, if, you've ever, <laughs> if you've ever played the game Hungry Hungry Hippos, um, the hippos eating as much as they can, um, that's like, that's like America, trying to get as much land as they can. Uh, of course, they wanted to enter, enter as a slave state. They're in the South. Um, however, anti-slavery protests and Mexican claims to Texas made President Jackson not move towards annexation. It's going to be other, another president who votes to annex. So they're still known at this time, 1836, the Lone Star Republic. Remember the Alamo, Davy Crockett. So Texas statehood. Uh, we're going to fast forward a little bit. And uh, the annexation of Texas is going to be a big political um, talking point. Democratic candidate James K. Polk promised to annex not only Texas, but Oregon and the Northwest Territory, the new Northwest, the the modern day Northwest, as well as by California from Mexico later. Both Northerners and Southerners appealed to this because they liked the idea, they continued the idea of manifest destiny, God given right. Uh, and Henry Clay, who originally opposed annexation, uh, but then favored it if they could avoid war with Mexico, he was also a presidential candidate. And because he opposed it, already at the beginning he's not going to be able to make enough votes uh come election time so james k polk wins that's james k polk uh he's the 11th president uh he will take office february 1845 congress will then pass a joint resolution to annex texas and in december texas becomes a state Six months later, the British and American governments agreed to split the Oregon Territory at the 49th parallel, with the U.S. gaining the territory below in the future states of what is to become Oregon, Washington, and Idaho, and Britain gained the province of British Columbia. If you don't know where that is, that's where Vancouver is located, British Columbia. So here you have the 49th parallel, if you remember from our uh, Louisiana Purchase map, and Britain gets all of this, Oregon country is ours, and this will soon become ours later. Or this is the, this is the focus. This is the dispute right here because Vancouver, very profitable port city, um, and of course this little this little little yellow bit is Alaska, which Russia claimed. All right, war with Mexico. So Texas's entry into the Union enraged the Mexican government. Uh, matters only worsened when they disputed over the southwest border of Tejas. Polk's aspirations to get California made matters even more worse. 
he's going to send an envoy to meet with the Mexican president Herrera, and he is not going to meet this American envoy. With no word from the government, Polk ordered General Zachary Taylor, future president Zachary Taylor, to move troops across the Nueces River, which both Mexico and the United States claimed. But here's the question of the day. James K. Polk and the American government needed to have Mexico fire the first shot. But why? Why would you need Mexico to fire the first shot? Well, it comes to May 9th, the Mexican army engages uh, Taylor's men. Four days later, Congress declares war. And that's why there needed to be, there is uh, evidence or there isn't any evidence to, to declare who shot first. Because if you read a, a Mexican account, a Mexican soldier's account, they will say the Americans shot first. You read an American soldier's account, they will say that the Mexicans shot first. And that's what James K. Polk needed. He needed the threat to American sovereignty, this, Amer this new American state that we just added, that it is a um, attack on American soil. Therefore, to defend our country, we have to go to war with Mexico. That's the reasoning. And that's what James K. Polk needed. So this whole area in, uh, that looks like a candy cane, uh, that is what we are fighting over. You have, uh, I believe the Nueces River goes this way, or it's one of these blue, no, it's, it's not that line. Nueces River right here. So this is where they moved. And this is the Rio Grande, which is the actual, what will become the actual border. So um, I, I have to talk a little bit about this. This is, you know, I, was, I taught in Fremont. And this, is where, this is where the city got its name. If you've ever not heard of Fremont, then, hey, a little California history for you. Uh, so settlers in Northern California, even before the declaration, were led by the leadership of a man named John C. Fremont, and they had an uprising. Um, and as you recall from Spanish mission days, that there wasn't really a lot of presence of Spanish uh, missionaries, Mexican soldiers. There's hardly any presence. Because again, as the further and further away you are from the capital city, Mexico City, Northern California, very far away from uh, Mexico City. So no real presence. June 14th, 1846, they declare themselves, uh, John Fremont, helps California declare themselves independent and they call it the Bear Flag Republic. Within a month, American Navy forces occupied the ports of San Francisco and San Diego. And despite losses in California and Texas, Mexico still refused to surrender. So um, again, the Bear Flag Revolt, 1846. This is the map of uh, troop movements. Um, hey, look. You guys have ever heard the word, the term Stockton, the city? Looky there. 209, represent. All right, uh, hashtag winning. So Polk sends General Winfield Scott to seize Mexico. This is what your uh, warrant was about. It took six months to get there, starting from Veracruz. They will capture the capital city September 1847. And in the end, the defeated Mexican officials signed the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, February 2nd, 1848. Mexico will have ceded more than 500,000, that's supposed to be 500,000 square miles of what are modern day states, California, Nevada, Utah, Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, and Wyoming. And this is called the Mexican Session. The Rio Grande is now the southern border of Texas. About 12,000 American lives lost. Now, the, the next question, of course, is whether these new lands should have slavery or not. And this is where the crisis starts. 
So again, all this land is now America. Texas is all ours. And of course, this northern border of Oregon, Washington is now ours. Whew. Shoo. All right, so there's a, a brief controversy in the, uh, it's called the Wilmot Controversy. Republican uh, David Wilmot, uh, not Republican, Representative David Wilmot, Democrat from Pennsylvania, proposed that any territory gained in that Mexican session land, neither slavery nor involuntary, ser voluntary servitude shall ever exist. However, there's going to be <clears throat> extreme Southern opposition, but a coalition of Northern Democrat and Whigs will pass the Wilmot Proviso in the House. However, the Senate, remember how a law becomes a bill, the Senate refuses to vote on it, so it won't become a law. This uh, Senator John C. Calhoun from South Carolina, you're going to hear that name a lot, argued that Americans settling in new territories had the right to bring their property, of course, including slaves. He argued that Congress had no power to ban slavery in the territories. So the idea of popular sovereignty. Uh, Senator Lewis Cass from Michigan suggested that citizens in the new territories have the choice to decide if slavery should be permitted or not. And this idea of popular sovereignty appealed to many members of Congress because it got rid of the slavery issue. It let the people decide. And if there are a lot more people in these new territories that wanna have slavery, then they should have slavery. And if they don't wanna have slavery, obviously they don't wanna have slavery. It seemed democratic because the new settlers had their own choice. Abolitionists, however, argue that it still denied African-Americans the right to freedom. In the 1848 election, you have Democrat Lewis Cass and Whig General Zachary Taylor will sidestep the slavery issue. Northern opponents joined with an abolitionist party, the Liberty Party, to form the new Free Soil Party. Don't know why they would split. They oppose slavery on the free soil of the new Western territory. That's why they're called the Free Soil. Slogan was free soil, free speech, free labor, and free men. Van Buren. Van Buren, Martin Van Buren, Mr. Trail of Tears guy, was their candidate. On election day, free soilers took votes away from Democrats, and in the end, Whig candidate Zachary Taylor won. And this is where third parties really become an issue um, in American politics because you have enemies. One side is pro-slavery, the other side is, you know, anti-slavery. But then you have some radicals who want to, to go a little bit more radical and completely end slavery at the, from existing period. So they will take votes away from the other party that they used to be a part of. And because they took votes away, the pro-slavery people will win. And that's General Zachary Taylor, now president. So slavery again becomes a hot topic within, within the year of his inauguration. James Marshall uh, found traces of gold in the stream of Sacramento. Word soon got out and soon uh, San Franciscans and everybody else left their homes to find gold. And the California gold rush was on. By the end of 1849, 80,049ers lived in California. This frenzy for gold led to chaos and violence. They needed a strong government to control it all. And soon the Bear Flag Republic of California sought for its own statehood. Oh, my bad. <laughs> the real 49ers, these guys. There's a poster. Immigration in California. So, again, slavery, big issue. At the time, there are 15 free, 15 slave states. Um, they were encouraged, California will be encouraged by President Taylor 
to enter the union as a free state. However, if California tipped the balance, as we discussed last lecture, the slave holding states would be the minority in the Senate, and we can't have that now, can we? No. Southerners feared that their loss of power in politics, so they go extremely radical and they threaten to secede from the Union. All because of adding California as a free state. However, the greatest, greatest man never to become president, Henry Clay, you know, he comes up with all these compromises. He settles, you know, South Carolina from seceding from the Union in the 1830s. Okay. He's going to try and find a compromise that would enable California to join and settle the other disputes about slavery. So California, he said, can enter as a free state, the rest of the Mexican session, all those other states, no restrictions on slavery. However, um, Congress prohibited the interfering with the domestic slave trade uh, and helped pass a stronger uh, or stronger law to help Southerners re recover runaways. And that's big. It intended to help the South more than the North. And it assured the South that the North would not try to abolish slavery after California joined the Union. So creating this Fugitive Slave Act will ensure Southerners have now have a right to go regain their property. Um, however, President Tay Tay gets sick. Clay's uh, proposal will trigger a massive debate in Congress. President Taylor unexpectedly dies from cholera in 1850. So Vice President Millard Fillmore will succeed him. And he supported annex, or not annex, adding California as a state. And so he will accept all of Henry Clay's provisions. And by September 1850, Congress passed all, uh, all parts of the Compromise of 1850. There are these five separate parts. Um, obviously, adding California as a, as a free state is, is one of the main ones. That's Millard Fillmore. The other big part of the compromise, again, the word compromise, you got to give something to get something. Uh, you meet in the middle. The Fugitive Slave Act, um, where obviously Northerners heavily opposed it, of the compromise, but it's a it's law now. Nothing you can do about it. Under this law, a slave holder or a slave catcher had to only point out alleged runaways to have them taken into custody. They could just point out to any random African American, free or runaway, and they would be arrested and sent back to the South. If you've ever seen the movie Twelve Years a Slave. This is exactly the premise of that. Um, a free African-American man living in, I think it was in Virginia, Maryland, was pointed out as being a runaway slave. And he was therefore then arrested, jailed, and taken back south. So this is going to lead to a lot of controversy as freed slaves with no money to defend themselves were put back into slavery. Marshals could deputize regular citizens to help with slave catching. You know, Southerners were, were anti-North, uh, anti uh, Northern policies. And the fact that they can put as many African-Americans back into servitude, um, they're going to do it. So it, again, it intended to help the South. However, it's gonna create so much animosity, this Fugitive Slave Act is gonna create so much animosity, so much hostility towards slavery among Northerners that they are going to be willing to fight to the death, surprise, 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 to end slavery. Uh, the Underground Railroad, uh, it's gonna to lead to many African-Americans. Again, AFAM, if you don't know now, I will abbreviate African-Americans to AFAM. Um, escaped slavery in the South. It was a well-organized network of abolitionists, people who were against slavery, abolitionists, 
to help several thousands of free of slaves uh, flee north. Conductors, transported runaways in secret. It's not an actual railroad, people. Just let it be known. Gave them shelter and food along the way. And obviously the most famous conductor, Harriet Tubman. And there she is. Uh, another railroad, the actual railroad, the transcontinental railroad, is really what's going to help, again, settle a lot of the West. The opening of the Oregon country in California convinced many people for a transcontinental railroad to have these people live near the stops. The Eastern starting point, however, would be contentious. Southerners pre preferred a Southern route from New Orleans to San Diego, uh, obviously going through the South. This land would lead through Northern Mexico. So US had to purchase that land for a cool $10 million. It's called the Gadsden Purchase. The little tiny bit of uh, Southern and Arizona and New Mexico. Senator Stephen A. Douglas uh, from Illinois, he preferred an Eastern starting point in Chicago. He knew that any route would lead through unorganized territory. So he's gonna call for the organization to be formed Nebraska, because we already got the Mexican session part. This other territory, not really settled yet, so let's call it Nebraska. And then you have the Kansas-Nebraska Act. Uh, key Southern committee leaders prevented this to ever happen. Before creating Nebraska, they would have to repeal the Missouri Compromise. Remember, no slavery across Missouri, north of Missouri's southern border. Stephen A. Douglas tried to say that N.E. Nebraska could have popular sovereignty. The Senate weren't buying it. So then Douglas proposes to repeal the Missouri Compromise and will divide the land into two territories, Nebraska to the north, Kansas to the south. If they didn't accept this, however, the south would secede. We couldn't have the South secede, so new president, President Pierce, will support it. It will barely pass in Congress in 1854. So here's the land. Okay, here's Illinois, Chicago, right around here. All right, and we got to go through Nebraska to get a transcontinental railroad to San Francisco. So we got to have this area organized and then this area. Now, look, no slavery allowed across Missouri's north of Missouri's southern border. So Kansas really can't have slavery, if you know what I'm saying. Franklin Pierce, 14th president. Bleeding Kansas. All right, so northerners will hurry into Kansas in hopes to create anti-slavery majority led by a guy, a famous guy, John Brown. Before elections in 1855, thousands of armed Missourians, they were nicknamed border ruffians, will cross the border to vote illegally to help elect a pro-slavery majority. Northerners will try to counter by creating a constitution banning slavery. You're either pro or you're against. And by 1856, there were two territorial governments in Kansas, one pro-slavery, the other anti. More and more Northerners will keep arriving and border ruffians, those Missouri people, are going to start attacking. It's called Bleeding Kansas in the newspapers as it became the scene of a territorial civil war. People are rushing, again, leaving their own homes to, to populate Kansas to be, a, you know, so they could apply for statehood, whether or not they wanted to, you know, have slavery or not. So a lot of people are coming to Kansas and a lot of People with strong opinions are coming to Kansas. This is John Brown. Talk about a person with strong opinions. Just look at that beard. All right, so as I mentioned, third party shenanigans. I talked about it briefly in the 1848 election. So Kansas and Nebraska were shattered, will shatter the Whig party. Northern Whigs joined those free soilers and other anti-slavery Northern Democrats to form the uh, uh, the Republican Party, which is modern day Democratic Party. Um, the main goal was to stop Southern planners from becoming uh, aristocratic to controlling the government. 
They didn't agree whether slavery should be abolished, but they preferred it not to be in the territories. All right, let's let's keep it keep them happy where they are, but you know, this new land we're not going to have slavery. In 1856, you have three candidates, uh Republican John C. Fremont, California, uh, Democrat James Buchanan, and Know Nothing Millard Fillmore, previous president, right? Buchanan, however, had uh, no stance on the Kansas-Nebraska Act. He campaigned that he could save the Union, and because of that, he won. Look at that. However, another big court case, probably yeah i would say this is a a big court case almost on on the ranks of even marbury versus madison two days later after his inauguration the supreme court ruled on the dred scott case if you don't know anything about dred scott dred scott was a former missouri slave taken to free territory to work for several years with a slaveholder after returning back to missouri scott sued for his freedom he argued that living in a free territory made him free not slave march 6 1857 supreme court chief justice scj roger b taney stated that congress's ban on slavery in western territory as part of the missouri compromise was unconstitutional he further went on to say that because dred scott was a slave he was property he therefore had no right to sue so therefore this shouldn't even have gone this case shouldn't even been heard because he has no right to sue his slaveholder bonkers what i say that's dred scott that's uh mr racist roger b taney kind of looks like snape John Brown's raid. So that guy with that crazy old beard, well, that guy was crazy. Uh, he's a, obviously, if you can tell, he's a fervent abolitionist, and he's going to react with violence. After pro-slavery forces sacked Lawrence Kans in Kansas territory, he will take his revenge by abducting and murdering five pro-slavery settlers in Potawatomi Creek. Um, and then brown developed a plan to start a rebellion against slaveholders he is going to incite rebellion 18 followers and john brown raided a federal arsenal a federal store of all guns and bullets and gunpowder all that at harper's ferry virginia uh general robert e lee will capture brown brown would be sentenced to die and he would be martyred for the cause of anti-slavery movement this guy was willing willing well he he did die um but he was willing to raid the federal arsenal that's like trying to oh well it already happened i'm not gonna say that uh the division of the democrats so southerners terrified and enraged northerners would try to arm enslaved people and encourage them to rebel southerners were afraid of this because it just happened and the key point was that Republicans opposed slavery. So April 1860, Democrats across the country gathered at Charleston, South Carolina to decide on their presidential candidate. Southern Democrats wanted their party to uphold the Dred Scott case and defend slaveholders' rights in the territories. Northern Democrats, led by Stephen A. Douglas, will prefer the idea of popular sovereignty. Northerners restated the idea of slave codes in territories. 50 Southern delegates walked out. They didn't choose a candidate. June 1860, Democrats reconvened in Baltimore. Again, Southern delegates walked out. The delegates that remained selected Stephen A. Douglas as their candidate. Delegates who left made their own convention in Richmond and nominated John C. Breckinridge, the current vice president. Republicans realized they had no chance in the South, so they needed a candidate to sweep the North, and they will turn to Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln was, uh, was popular 
Uh, he gained national reputation during the debates with Stephen A. Douglas. He's also from Illinois. Uh, the modern Stephen Douglas, uh, the Lincoln Douglas debating style comes from that debate. Um, Lincoln, if you don't know, Lincoln was not an abolitionist. However, he believed that slavery was immoral and he opposed its spread into Western territories. During his campaign, he remained true to the free soiler beliefs and appealed to Southern states to preserve slavery within the borders. He supported high tariffs to protect manufacturers and workers. He wanted a new homestead law in the West and funds for a transcontinental railroad. Well, by golly gee, sounds like a good candidate. So Republicans' proposals angered Southerners. It's good to note, Lincoln did not win any Southern state. However, he did win uh, the North, except New Jersey. Um, Democrats were divided, so Republicans will win their second ever national campaign. Southerners viewed Lincoln's election as a threat to their society, culture, and their lives. December 1860, South Carolinians met together to repeal the ratification of the Constitution and seceded from the Union. Six states will follow suit uh, when Lincoln is inaugurated in March 1861. And one month later, the other four states will uh, secede April 1861. They argued that they saw it as the American Revolution in aspects that it was a necessary course of action to uphold the people's rights in the South, their right to slavery. So new country is created. The union's initial response was, uh, it was Buchanan's fault. He couldn't hold it together. There's a Crittenden's compromise Slavery extend the 3630 line to California. Obviously, that's going to get voted down. Lincoln argued that slavery in the new territory acknowledges that slavery has equal rights with liberty and surrenders all we have contended for. So he's very good at saying how bad slavery has become. So now he's saying that slavery that we've built up, that we've sadly continued since our you know, foundation in 1776, that slavery almost a hundred years later is on par, is on the same level as the Declaration of Independence. Think about that. February 8th, like I said, 1861, delegates from the seceding, uh, from the seceding states decided to form a new nation, the Confederate States of America, and they chose Jefferson Davis as their president. Abraham Lincoln, that's Jefferson Davis. And that is the end of this lecture. And again, Mr. Ovalle does not have the textbook from hold one minute, hold one minute. One of these days, one of these days, I'm gonna be extremely prepared hello all right we're almost there anywho um hopefully you guys did enjoy this um i know it was a little bit longer but not not as many notes i hope um so hopefully your hands aren't hurting anyways geez okay your homework is page 87 Quest, uh, the lesson one review, questions two through four. Okay, so, you know, a lot of stuff. You know, war with Mexico, the 1850s, leading up to the uh, 11 states seceding from the Union. And the next lecture, guess what we're talking about? The Civil War. All right. If you guys did enjoy this, make sure you hit that like button, leave a comment, subscribe, helps your boy out. And I'll... Uh, Wait, that's my that's my golf YouTube. Uh, <laughs> that's my golf YouTube outro. Stay safe. Wash your hands. I'll see you guys next time. Peace.